There is no question that most discussions on the Holy Spirit tend to center themselves upon the role of the Spirit and the role He plays in our lives as individuals. When you come to church, you'll hear hear sermons that, that talk about the Holy Spirit's activity in our lives even before we came to Jesus. The role of the Holy Spirit convicting us of sin, leading us to the cross. Sometimes you'll hear a discussion on the Holy Spirit that'll focus in on the essential involvement He plays in our regeneration, in our salvation. The fact that we're born again, how? Through the indwelling of the Spirit of God, that this heart of stone is replaced with the Spirit. It's also totally normal to come to church and for the pastor to set time aside to dig into the importance of a continual empowering that we receive when the Spirit comes upon us so that we might fulfill the great commission that Jesus gave us all. Aside from these topics, it's likely that you've heard a sermon on the Holy Spirit that focuses on His role in the process of our sanctification. The process the Holy Spirit plays in our lives naturally producing, well, fruit of the Spirit. In a greater Christ-likeness. Through that process of denying the flesh and as Paul would write so eloquently, walking in the Spirit. And while all of these conversations about the Holy Spirit are important, and while they demand our consideration, rarely do we ever take the time to unpack the Holy Spirit and His role in the local church. It's always the individual, but not the corporate assembly. Historically, as you examine the formations of the first church, recorded for us in the book of Acts, as you chart the spread of the gospel from Jerusalem to the far reaches of the earth, you can't help, as you turn the pages of the book of Acts, noticing that the Holy Spirit, this third person of the Trinity, is one of the central characters to this particular story. Most call the book of Acts the Acts of the Disciples. Others would brand it the Acts of Jesus through the Disciples. The Holy Spirit is the main character. Not only did Jesus promise the Spirit before His ascension, not only did Jesus instruct His early disciples after giving them the Great Commission to go to Jerusalem and wait, but Jesus was clear as to the important role the Holy Spirit would play, why they needed to wait. In Acts chapter 1, we read that Jesus commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, Jesus said, you've heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized, Jesus said, with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. You shall then receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. There is no question that our ability as Christians to fulfill this great commission necessitates the involvement of the Holy Spirit. To this point, ten days after Jesus said these things to His disciples, in Acts chapter 2, Luke records that when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they, these 120 or so followers of Jesus, were with one accord in one place, and suddenly, Luke tells us, there came a sound from heaven. As of a rushing mighty wind. There wasn't a wind. It was describing the sound. And it filled the house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire. Again, they weren't fire, but as a fire. It's descriptive language. And one sat upon each of them. And they were filled, we're told, with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Jesus predicted the Spirit in Acts 1, and then the Spirit arrives in Acts 2. And what follows this amazing moment was an incredible sermon given by Peter. Peter stands up and he explains to those that were present what was taking place. The end result is that 3,000 souls were saved. And the church of Jesus Christ was born through a specific moving of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, friend, birthed the church. And note, as it pertains to the church and its local manifestation, this would not be the last time we see the Holy Spirit's direct and specific involvement. 
In Acts chapter 4, following a report that Peter and John gave, the church of their appearance before the Jewish Sanhedrin, we read, and when they, the church, had prayed, following this report, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Same group, originally filled, filled again, and they spoke the Word of God with more boldness. Again, as you chart your way through Acts, as the church grows, as it began experiencing satanic onslaughts, we see the Holy Spirit's direct intervention. Again, actively preserving the integrity of the work. In Acts 5, we read a story of the Spirit's involvement in response to the ill intents of Ananias and his wife Sapphira. We're told that they lied to the Holy Spirit. They played the hypocrite and they were struck down and killed by the Spirit. In a more positive twist, in the very next chapter, we again witness the Holy Spirit's direct involvement. Recorded when he played a pivotal role in the recruitment of seven godly men, deacons, to aid the apostles in the growing ministry needs of that church. One of these deacons, a man by the name of Philip, following a persecution that arose in Jerusalem, heads into Samaria, takes the gospel with him, and a church is born. Acts chapter 8 then records how Peter and John came to see this fresh work, what God was doing, but they recognized that there was a component missing. So we're told they prayed that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet, they, He had not fallen upon them. So they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. As you work your way through the book of Acts, not only will you see the Holy Spirit playing an important role in the life of Saul, and then his conversion to Paul in Acts 9, but then in Acts 10, the Spirit is instrumental. And the gospel being extended to the house of Cornelius through the apostle Peter. In Luke chapter 10, in Acts chapter 10, verses 44 and 45, Luke records that while Peter was still speaking to the household of Cornelius, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed, or the Jews, they were astonished at this, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on Gentiles also. At the end of Acts 11, you'll witness another really undeniable moving of the Holy Spirit. His involvement in church affairs. In Acts 11, verses 27 and 30, we're told in those days prophets came to Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them, Agabus, stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout the world, which happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. They did this. The elders, they sent it by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. In fact, the argument can be made that Paul's entire missionary movements were initiated, fueled, and directed by the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 13, in the first four verses, Luke tells us, Now in the church that was at Antioch, this is in Syria, there were certain prophets and teachers. And then he includes a list of them. But we're told as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said to them, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Actual quotations of the Holy Spirit speaking. Then having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on Barnabas and Saul and sent them away. And so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went to Seleucia and from there sailed to Cyprus. I could go on and on with example after example after example. But as you read the book of Acts, my point is that there is no question the Holy Spirit not only birthed the church, but it was then through His specific intervention and interactions that the church received its marching orders. The Spirit birthed the church and directed the church. Yes, the Scriptures are clear that Jesus is the head of the church, but the Scriptures are equally clear that it's the Holy Spirit that what gives the life and vitality to the church. Jesus is the head, but think of the Spirit as the lifeblood. As you examine the specific role of the Spirit within the early church, there are three functions of the Spirit that become evident. The Holy Spirit, again, as being this lifeblood, fosters unity. This is His role. He fosters unity. He enables worship. And He provides gifts aimed at edifying the believers. If you're a note taker, I'll just repeat them for you. 
Three things the Spirit does in a local church. Fosters unity, one. Two, enables worship. Three, provides gifts aimed at the edification of the body. Now, pertaining to unification, we understand something important. It's evident here this morning. And it is the fact that there is one thing that runs deeper than blood. And it is spirit. Spirit runs deeper than blood. You see, it's in the spirit, this common spirit, the Holy Spirit, that we all have a greater commonality that transcends any of our natural differences. Whether they be age or race or politics or preference, we have one spirit and it trumps all else. Unequivocally, the Holy Spirit is the fundamental basis for all Christian unity. Without the Holy Spirit, there would be no basis. As a matter of fact, disunity is often the evidence that a group of people have departed from a dependency on this common spirit that should unify. To this point, the Apostle Paul will write to the church, this local church, in the city of Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 4, Paul writes, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with loneliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing one another in love. And then he writes, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Then Paul says, there is one body and one Spirit. Just as you were called in the hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. And writing to another local church located in the ancient city of Philippi, Paul will again reiterate the same basic but essential principle. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, Paul says, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. While it is the Holy Spirit that brings a church together, while it is the Holy Spirit that knits us as one body, the Spirit is also essential to our individual and corporate worship of God. Not only will Paul say in Philippians 3, verse 3, that we worship God in spirit, but in John 4, verse 24, Jesus said that because God is spirit, those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. Understand the act of worshiping God. Whether it be through song, like we did a few minutes ago, or service, other types of manifestation of, of worship. These things are designed to transcend the physical and help us engage God in the spiritual realm. Without the Spirit, that's impossible. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3, a passage we'll get to in a moment, but Paul says that no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Never forget, it is the Holy Spirit that enables you and I the all-important connection with God and whose involvement brings each of us into God's holy presence. This doesn't happen in a physical sense, but a spiritual one. And without the Spirit's involvement, the worship of God can't take place. To this point, the gift of tongues, which we're not going to spend a lot of time on this morning. The gift of tongues, in a bit of a fly-by definition, is given to a person by the Holy Spirit. It's a gift. But it's a gift that's designed to enable a worshiper a more intimate and personal expression and a more expanded explanation on this particular gift given by Paul in 1 Corinthians 14. We come to understand that tongues is a moment when the Holy Spirit helps a person articulate themselves without the limitation of human language. Have you ever been in a moment where you're frustrated to express yourself? You can't find the words. Tongues is the moment where God equips you and enables you in that moment to express yourself. Think of tongues 
as a love language between the worshiper and God, but it's given by whom? Again, the Holy Spirit enabling worship. Finally, the unity that we enjoy in the Spirit, as well as our corporate worship, these two things, please note, are deepened through the edification of the Spirit within the local church that manifests corporately through what we're told to be gifts that the Holy Spirit bestows individuals. In three different places, Ephesians 4, Romans 12, and 1 Corinthians 12, the Apostle Paul will describe these specific gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, for our purposes this morning, I want to focus our attention on Paul's exhortation to the local church, the local church in a city known as Corinth, the Corinthians. Now, the first 11 chapters of this letter are not super friendly. As a matter of fact, as you read through them, you'll notice that, that, that Paul is addressing some serious issues of carnality that had taken root in this local church that they were being carnal. And yet following this lengthy rebuke, Paul wants to transition to spiritual things. He writes in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant, which means that it's easy to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles, carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Now, back in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 4 through 8, Paul began his letter with an interesting admonition. He says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by Jesus, in all utterance and knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Then he says, so that you've come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it would appear that this Corinthian church, while there was issues of carnality, they did possess a full expression of the Holy Spirit, of the Spirit of God, active, working in their midst. Paul says, you've come short and no gift. This church was not dead in its expression or restricted in its worship. In the Corinthian church, the Holy Spirit was alive and active. And yet, because of the Corinthians' history with paganism and pagan worship and the mysticism that often came associated with these things, Paul, in chapter 12, wants to discuss these gifts of the Spirit and how they should manifest. Verse 3 marks an important transition. Paul says, therefore... Now, before Paul gets into the particulars... He wants to first establish a broad principle regarding spiritual gifts. And this is important for us. Notice how Paul continues. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul's point here is to establish for the church, for us, a baseline by which all of the gifts of the Spirit And how those gifts manifest should be judged. So it's a baseline. The easy question we should always ask in any discussion about the gifts of the Spirit or how they play a role in the assembly is to ask, are they bringing glory to Jesus? Is Jesus being glorified by what's happening here? If he's not, this is not the Holy Spirit. In discussing the coming of the Spirit in John chapter 15 verse 26, Jesus said to his disciples, But when the Helper comes, he's talking about the Spirit, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father. And then Jesus says, He, the Spirit, will testify of me. The Spirit will testify of me, Jesus says. I get to this point in John 16, verses 13 and 14. Jesus will say, However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears... He will speak, and He will tell you things to come. And then Jesus says, The Spirit will glorify Me, for He will take what is Mine and declare it to you. So when you discuss gifts, how they're to be manifesting in a church, 
The first is what's happening here glorifying Jesus because the Spirit fundamentally exists to testify of Jesus and to bring Jesus glory. So with that understanding, Paul continues, verse 4, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. This has nothing to do with the Bible study, but one of the things I love about this verse is that you have just this subtle inclusion of all three members of the triune nature of God. One Spirit, one Lord, one Father. Now what Paul is describing in these verses is critical to your understanding of the gifts of the Spirit. He describes them, look at it again, as diversities of gifts, diversities of ministries, and diversities of activities. Differences of ministries, diversities of activities. Now, in the English, in our translation here, it it appears, in just a cursory reading, that Paul is referencing three separate things. However, in the Greek structure of this verse... The initial gifts, the differences of gifts, it's presented in a very broad sense. Within, in the Greek structure, ministries and activities being what appears to be two separate manifestations of the gifts. It's as though Paul is saying, there are gifts, and of those gifts, there are ministries and there are activities. Towards the end of the chapter, Paul will define some of these ministries, or even better translated, offices, positions within a church. He defines some of them as being apostles and prophets, teachers, needs. Literally, helper, administration. And Ephesians 4 verse 11, Paul will even give a more extensive list of these ministries. He says that Jesus gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists. That's that's a new listing. Some pastors and teachers. And why did he give these? for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body. Well, the first spiritual gifting of the Holy Spirit are these formal ministry roles within the church. And again, what's the purpose of them? Well, it's equipping, but for what? The edification of the body. We could do a whole study on these uh, ministries themselves. But for our purposes, I want to spend our time on the second set of spiritual gifts, These diversity of activities. And the reason I want to spend time looking at the diversity of activities is that I think, I believe, I'm convinced that these need a bigger place and role in our church. In the Greek, the word we have presented as activities, this word activities, it's energemia, which we actually derive the English word energy from. Activities. The word here describes an active, miraculous, supernatural working of Holy Spirit power operating at work within a church community. These activities are not just limited, by the way, to those who fill the offices or the ministries. This is a second category. These apply to everyone who's a part of the body. Now, before Paul starts describing the various activities that are yielded through the gifting of the Holy Spirit or the offices or ministries towards the end of the chapter, Paul takes a moment here before he gets into the listings of them to explain one more important principle. Verse 7, Paul says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Not only are we aware that the gifts of the Spirit manifest in distinctly different ways, But according to Paul here, the gifts themselves serve three vital functions. First, Paul describes the gifts as the manifestation of the Spirit. Did you see that? The manifestation of the Spirit. His point here is that the gifts and their activity are clear, evident, and the visible nature of the Holy Spirit Himself. In a way, the gifts are a way the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, makes His presence known and aware in a church community. So first, 
The manifestation of the Spirit. Secondly, Paul says, this is given to each one. Notice that by the very nature of it being a gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit, we understand these things are bestowed by the Spirit. The gifts, by their basic definition, cannot be earned, nor can they be conjured up by the individual, which goes against a lot of charismatic thought. In verse 11, we read, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually. How? As He wills. The distribution, the allocation of gifts occur via the will of the Spirit. Finally, why is that the case? Why does He distribute to each one as He wills? Well, Paul says, for the profit of all. Again, as these things intertwine with our unity, a healthy church is the byproduct to these specific and distinct gifts of the Holy Spirit manifesting through each individual for the benefit of all. In Romans 12, verse 4, Paul will write to the local church in Rome, For we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one in Christ, and individually members to one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to each of us, Paul says, let us use them. As a member of Calvary 316, there are two things that are true. One, you have been given gifts by the Holy Spirit. You don't earn them. You likely don't deserve them. But they've been given by His will to you. So one, you have gifts, supernatural gifts. Gifts given by the God of the universe through His Spirit. And two, they should be used to edify everyone else here. I know that this is a bit lengthy, but I want to read the remaining chapter. 1 Corinthians 12, beginning with verse 12. Again, I know it's long, but Paul, he makes such a powerful point. I'll just let him say it in his own words. He says, for as the body, and he's talking to a local church. As the body is one, and as many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, and have all been made to drink in one Spirit. For in fact, Paul says, the body is not one member, but many. And again, if, if you were thinking, well, with the membership concept we rolled out last Sunday, why, why not brand it something else? You know, membership has so much negative connotations to it. Well, the reason we went with the word member is because it's literally the biblical term to describe that connecting. you a member of the body. Body's not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I'm, I am not of the body, is, therefore, is it therefore not part of the body? If, if the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the smelling be? Now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body, just as He pleased. He pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed, there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on those we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it. And there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. For if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and members individually. 
And God has appointed these things in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, gifts of healing, helps, administration, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles though? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts. And yet I will show you a more excellent way. And then it's, what's awesome is that you get to chapter 13. And we know chapter 13 is being what? The love chapter. You see, Paul will then explain that the focus of the gifts are to be a way that we express our love to God, but also expressing our love to one another. So, what are these activities? The gifts of the Holy Spirit should be yielding in a church for that church to be healthy. Look back, beginning in verse 8. Paul kind of gets to his list. He says, For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. This word of wisdom can be thought of as the channeling of the wisdom of God. Defining wisdom as the appropriate application of knowledge. A word of wisdom is the manifestation of a supernatural counsel or advice to help see and wade through the issue. Paul continues to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. Different from wisdom, this word of knowledge given by the Spirit affords an individual insight and understanding into something they couldn't possibly have ever known. <laughs> I see this actually happen a lot through the preaching ministry. And, and this is how it manifests. Someone will come up and say, how did you know what was going on in my life? Did my wife call you? Because what you were saying was, was hit. there's no way you could have known. To which my answer is, no, your wife didn't call me. Two, there's no way I did know. And three, that's the Holy Spirit, man. If you're upset about it, don't take it out on me. Take it. You deal with him. Have you ever been in one of those moments where, where you just feel like you have just a word of knowledge that someone's going through something? Like you couldn't have known it, but it just manifests. Knowledge. Verse 9, Paul says to another faith by the same Spirit. In Ephesians 2, verse 8, we know, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And then Paul says, That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So we know that faith, any faith, is a gift of God. And yet, this spiritual gift of faith, it appears to be something else entirely. This gifting of the Spirit, the gift of faith, is kind of a, a, an act of, think of it, remarkable faith. To believe in God in a supernatural way. A, a great illustration of this would be Peter getting out of the boat in the middle of the storm to walk to Jesus. That was a remarkable step of faith. It was followed by a quick sinking but give the guy credit. He walked on the water. Like he, in a moment, the Spirit gifted him with the ability to get out of, to do something crazy. The gift of faith. I have a brother. Shoot. Andy Perez has the gift of faith. He works in my life through that gifting where I doubt. I mean, Andy's like, we'll just jump off the cliff, man. But, yeah, but that's just the dumbest decision we can make. No, yeah, but the Lord's with us. Yeah, but, yeah, it's still crazy. Uh, yep, that by definition, it's crazy, and we should do it. Just jump off the, okay, man. But it's a gift of faith. That's a manifestation of the Spirit, because I lack faith. My prayer, more often than not, is, Lord, I believe, quickly followed with, a, but help my unbelief. And yet in my life, I've got brothers that have this gift that minister to me. Paul also says to another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. Within the language, this can have a, a dual meaning. The gift of healings can apply just as much to the individual who receives a healing as to the one doing the healing. God might use you in a supernatural way to pray over someone for healing. I've seen that happen. But understand, you're also experiencing the same gift if you're the one that's been healed. It's a gift of healing. It's this two-way street. 
This is the one gift that seems to get doubted the most because of our Western limitations. And yet, just read through the Gospels and the book of Acts and tell me. I see this as the, probably the most common manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Healings are all over the book. We also see, to another, verse 10, the working of miracles. This word, miracles, is dynamis. Literally power. Dynamite. It's where we get the word. And what Paul is describing seems to be a manifestation of just a supernatural power that happens in a moment through an individual, a moment that just God interjects in some radical way to another prophecy. From a, a kind of a complete biblical understanding of this idea of prophecy, we understand that prophecy is simply the telling forth of God's word. That, that's its most basic definition. Sometimes prophecy can be predictive in nature, undoubtedly. But not always. Think of prophecy as divinely inspired speech. Most of the time, I've seen this gift manifest corporately when someone stands up and shares a passage of Scripture that ministers to somebody else in a radical way. It's the speaking of God through you to someone else, a word of prophecy. My mom tried to get pregnant for years, went to a pastor's wives conference. Her heart was grieving over this, weighed down by this. She was in a small group and a lady by the name of Jean McClure, they were praying over my mom. She had a gift of prophecy and said a year from that day, she'd have a baby boy. A year from that day, May 29th, 1983, I came into the world. It's a prophecy my mom would love to take back. But still, these things happen. And they're used by God to bless and to minister to us, to edify. In regards to the way by the, uh, that prophecy should work, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 29-32, through 32, Paul will say, Let two or three prophets speak, and let others judge. If anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep it silent. For you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be encouraged. But, then Paul says, let the spirit of the prophets be subject to the prophets. And so in a corporate setting, if there is prophecy, it's to be weighed and measured and tested by the prophets. Paul continues, he says, to another discerning of spirits. Again, my mom had the gift of discernment. We couldn't get away with anything in my house. She took one look at us and, oh, you've been up to something. Discernment. This judging. Paul is describing a spirit-inspired ability to not only judge between what is true and false, but to have a deeper insight into the intentions of an individual, what their deeper motivations might be. He says to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. As I've already noted, tongues is a gift of spirit grants the soul that's struggling to express the heart, provides that individual an outlet of praise. But because tongues is by definition for one's personal benefit, a love language between you and God, it's only edifying to the church as a whole if it comes with an interpretation. Well, the person speaking in tongues doesn't know what they're saying. The interpretation allows everyone else present to be edified by the expression of their heart to the Lord. Again, Paul explaining how that should work in the church. He says in 1 Corinthians 14, If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or at the most three in each turn, and let one interpret. If there is no interpreter, let them keep silent in the church. And let him speak to God and to himself. Paul then says, I think, my God, I speak with tongues more than any of you. Yet in the church I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say you're out of your minds? For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, and in all the churches of the saints. And then he wraps up kind of the whole section saying, Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy, and do not forbid the speaking of tongues, but let all things be done decently and in order. In Romans 12, Paul adds a few additional 
of the activity gifts. He'll mention the gift of ministry. This is a person that has a servant's heart. And our church is filled with servants. That Holy Spirit desire to just serve. Paul says that there's the gift of exhortation. This is a person who is just, by nature, encouraging. They love to console. This is the, the Barnabas ministry, the son of encouragement. Paul says that there's the gift of giving. This is the uh, working of the Holy Spirit in someone's life to have just this special generosity. He describes the gift of mercy. This is someone who just, the Holy Spirit works in their life to aid a person who's being afflicted, struggling. Aside from these things, Paul gives a few additional instructions in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26, he says that whenever you come together, again, speaking to a church, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. In closing, the reason I find this discussion to be so important for our church is that beginning next Sunday, we're going to set aside one service a quarter for these activity gifts of the Spirit to manifest in our church service. Now don't get me wrong. Every Sunday, the Holy Spirit is clearly working. The Spirit meets us and speaks to us through the teaching of God's Word. He infuses our worship, knits us in unity, Beyond this, these activity gifts are already evident in the way that they manifest themselves organically. You know, without instruction or a defined structure, the Spirit uses each of you, and know this, to edify the body, the church here at Calvary 316, in a unique and distinct way. We don't tell you to do it. We don't provide you a way to do it. But it's done anyway. And yet... We do believe that these blessings can be enhanced if we take time and we just set it aside once a quarter to just allow the Holy Spirit to move in our midst and these gifts to work corporate. In decency and in order, without a weirdness, but effectively. The Holy Spirit started Calvary 316. I won't bore you with the whole story, but it was a work of the Holy Spirit. And there is no questioning the impact the Holy Spirit has played in each of our lives individually. However, His role corporately is just as critical today as it was when it was in the beginning. I speak for the elders when I say that we want to have a greater sensitivity when it comes to allowing the Holy Spirit to manifest His presence in our midst. When we worship, to be free. Again, we realize that it's through the manifestation of these gifts in you and through you that the Holy Spirit will make His presence known in a more powerful way here at Calvary 316. The unity that we enjoy can only continue from a greater dependency on the Holy Spirit. Our worship together can only deepen from His presence being continually experienced. But both our unity and our worship necessitate the edification of the Spirit manifesting corporately through the gifts that He's bestowed to each of us. As Paul wrote, I'll close, having then gifts Differing according to the grace that has been given to each of us. Let us use them. And so, Father, that's what we ask. That your spirit would do something naturally. That as we take and set time aside, that you'll meet us here. And work as only you can. We pray for next Sunday. 
We anticipate and are excited for what you'll do. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to explain uh, just very quickly. Um, and do we have the heat running, man? Larry, is the heater on? Okay. See, it's gotten cold, and anyway, need to, neither here nor there. Next Sunday, this is how this will work, just real practical. Um, on Sunday morning, man, we let you got you, know, you sit wherever you want. Every Sunday morning, some of you like the tables, man. The tables are great. It works for your iPad, your thing, and uh, man, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. I, I never take it personally that no one sits on the front row. I appreciate those who sit on the second row. But it's just, uh, maybe it's just the outlaw nature of us that, um, you know, the rebels sit in the back. You know, I get it. But for what we're going to try to do next Sunday, we're going to ask that, that, that we fill up the front first and then move our way back. The ushers will be instructed for that. Um, and the reason for it is that we'll start our service normal. We won't have communion available. We'll start with worship. The elders and I, as this progresses, um, I'll come up and, and provide a, a quick recap of this. You know, just so you, if someone wasn't here this morning, they know what's going on. And then Andy will stay at the piano all morning. We'll take some communion together. We'll sing some songs. The elders will sit up front if you need prayer to be prayed for. Then you'll be, you can come down for prayer to be anointed with oil, whatever. We'll give a time where it'll be quiet. And if the Lord moves a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom, in your heart to share, then there'll be a moment where you can stand up and you can share that. Again, if it's prophecy, we'll test it, as the scriptures tell us to. If it's tongues, <laughs> if it's tongues, what will happen is when the person's done, we will wait for the gift of interpretation. If the interpretation is, thus saith the Lord, you know it's not the interpretation. Because tongues is not the Lord speaking to us. It's you speaking to the Lord. And we'll wait for an inter If there's no interpretation, then we'll ask that that gift not happen. And we'll move on. That's what the scriptures tell us to do. We'll just go off of what the Bible says. Again, if you want to pray for someone, pray with someone. We're just going to take time and just minister to each other. There's not going to be just this real defined structure other than some worship and we'll take communion as a, as a congregation. We'll pass the elements and take it together. And we're going to do this four times a year. We're going to call it a pneuma service. Pneuma spirit in the Greek. Just four times a year. We'll set the normal protocols aside and this is what we'll do. I'm excited to see what God will, will, will accomplish. I think it will be cool. I think that there's a need for this in the church, and you don't find it often, especially in Sunday service. Um, yes, if you've never been in anything like this, it's going to feel a little awkward at first. But I will tell you what will happen. When there's edification and the presence of God in our midst, that awkwardness will go away like that. And you, there's no expectation for you to say anything or to pray anything. We're just going to let God work. This is not the service to bring an unbeliever to. This is not the service to bring, um, you know, that person you've been evangelizing, you've been with. If, if someone shows up, um, we welcome them, and we will trust that God ordained them to be here for whatever was going on. I'll tell you just a quick story, and then I, and I'll let you go. Um, Pastor John Corson, who pastors um, the Calvary Chapel in Oregon, it's called Applegate Christian Fellowship. He tells the story of they did um, they had rented this hotel in the conference 
center part of the hotel to do a big marriage conference. And, uh, but part of the agreement is that in the meeting room, they had, they had to contractually have an open bar. And John was like, well, we're not going to drink or spend anything on it, but okay, if that's part of the contract, that's, that's fine. And they gave the, the bartender a tip to make sure that he was taken care of, but, you know, it had to be open. Well, they had, in one of the evenings, they did what, what we're going to do. And the gift of tongues happened. And John did the, the normal protocol. Is there a gift of interpretation? Gave it a minute. No interpretation. Okay, we're going to ask that, that this not happen again. Decency in order, no problem. People started leaving afterwards. The bartender came up to John with tears pouring down his face an immigrant from Iran. His hometown spoke a very distinct type of Farsi. He wanted to know how that person knew his native tongue. And John was like, well, he didn't. But he said beautiful things about God and to God. So John explained what happened, and he gave his life to Jesus. If an unbeliever shows up, and we will post this on the website. We will do our part to articulate. But I trust that everyone that's here next Sunday, God ordained them to be here for whatever he has planned because we don't have a lot planned. Isn't that kind of freeing and scary? <laughs> Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you.